The Russia-Ukraine conflict reaches 100 days with no end in sight. What's next? Hello, I'm Arnold Neider and this is The Heat. days ago, Russia started what it called a special military operation in Ukraine. Since then, thousands of people have died on both sides. After Russia initially deployed its forces near the capital, Kyiv, the fighting is now concentrated in the eastern part of the country, which Russian forces control. We begin with this report from Philip Crowther in Lviv. As Ukraine marks 100 days of Russia's invasion here, it's difficult really to understand what's been happening during this time. Ukrainians today reflecting on what exactly has happened to their country with pride, first of all, because the Ukrainian army has been able to defend large parts of the territory much better than anybody could have expected. But also, of course, you look back on all the tragedy and all the brutality that has happened in this country over the last 100 days. Irpin, Bucha are just some of the places that have left behind those awful scenes that everybody knows about. Now, there are other numbers worth looking at. And, for example, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, said it only 24 hours ago that up to 100 Ukrainian soldiers are losing their lives every single day. That's largely in the eastern Donbass region. And, of course, on the Russian side, there are believed to have been tens of thousands of soldiers uh, killed as well. In the meantime, of course, there are many front lines, or should we say one long front line uh, here in Ukraine. Zelensky says that it's over a thousand kilometers long. The most fierce fighting is happening in the Luhansk region, where the governor says that Maybe Ukrainian troops managed to get 20% of territory back. Impossible to verify those things on the ground because it is simply so dangerous to be in the city of Severodonetsk, which the Luhansk governor uh, mentioned earlier. Now, next to uh, Severodonetsk uh, sits the city of Lysychansk. It is believed to be potentially the next one in Russia's crosshairs. 60% of the buildings there are destroyed, according to the governor. And it's also worth remembering that along that very, very long front line of over a thousand kilometers according to President Zelensky. Well, there is fighting in many, many places and there is Russian shelling in many places as well. That was the case in Donetsk. That's the other part of the Donbass region, but also in Kharkiv. That's in the northeast, Zaporizhia in the south. After 100 days of war, there is no real, really realistic way of seeing how it's going to end anytime soon. Philip Crowther, Associated Press for CGTN in Lviv, Ukraine. To discuss what's next for Ukraine, we are joined now by Pavlo Kukta. He is a former Ukrainian acting minister of economic development. He joined us from Kyiv. Anton Fedyashin is a professor of history at American University right here in Washington, D.C. Also here in Washington, D.C., Max Blumenthal is editor at the graysone.com. And Richard Arnold is an associate professor of political science at Muskingum University in the U.S. state of Ohio. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And, Pavlo, let me start with you. As we've been saying, 100 days into what Russia called its special military operation. This is what President Zelensky said to mark the occasion. Let's listen. We have been defending Ukraine for 100 days now. Victory will be ours. Glory to Ukraine. So, Pablo, the president there talking about victory for Ukraine. Of course, this could mean that this conflict could last a much longer time. There could be a lot more loss of life and there could be a lot more destruction to the country. Um, is Ukraine prepared for this or perhaps is it time for the country to be looking at some kind of negotiated solution? Well, I think we all understand that any war ends with negotiations and this is like how this war will end as well. Actually, uh, this is consistently what Zelensky himself is messaging. So, uh, essentially, Ukraine is ready for negotiations. There is a caveat, of course. These negotiations have to be conducted on presidential levels between Zelensky and Putin, because what we've seen so far is that people delegated by Kremlin to conduct negotiations uh, actually never have a mandate to come to any kind of decision. So ultimately, it all uh, boils down to a decision by Putin. So far, he has not been willing to negotiate. He has not been willing to meet with uh, Zelensky. 
Ukraine is quite interested in ending this war. It's going on in our territory. Our people are dying. So uh, I think the blame on the conflict being started and going to continue in every day should be put squarely on Russia. It's on the Russian side. The ball is on their side, and Moscow can end it any time. Anton Fedyoshin, what is your assessment of the situation right now, especially uh, what Pavlo just told us about ending this conflict? Are the Russians prepared to go to the negotiating table at that level, at presidential level? No, they're not. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I have to say that this is standard uh, practice um, in international diplomacy. You don't start negotiations from the top. You start them from the bottom uh, up. And so there had been negotiations going on. The last major round that everyone paid attention to was, of course, in, uh, in Turkey. Um, and since then, things have uh, really simmered down. Uh, the Russians don't seem to uh, think that this is a, a time for them to uh, really make any major concessions, given that it looks like the tide on the battlefield in Donbass, uh, at least, has actually turned in their favor. Um, not radically so, but gradually over the past uh, several weeks. So before Zelensky and Putin meet, there's going to have to be a lot of uh, details hashed out um, at the negotiating table uh, by uh, the lower ranking teams, because as uh, Pablo and everyone else uh, I'm sure understands, there will be an enormous amount of questions uh, that need to be debated, borders, uh, you know, uh, uh, water borders, land borders, all sorts of things, withdrawals of troops, guarantees. You know, Zelensky Putin sitting, sitting down uh, for several hours are doubtful to resolve this. They're going to wait for papers to be brought to them so that they can take them to their respective government. So um, I'm very pessimistic about this uh, thing ending anytime uh, soon. But the sooner the lower level negotiations restart, the better for everyone. Anton, you talk about borders. It would seem that Russia at this stage, it's consolidating its positions in eastern Ukraine. As President Zelensky has said, uh, the Russians are thought to occupy something like 25, 20 percent of Ukraine right now. That's a fifth of the country. So do you see Russia actually withdrawing completely uh, from those areas that it occupies right now? Um, it depends on which areas we're uh, talking about, from uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, territories, which, by the way, they don't fully control within their official administrative uh, uh, borders. Um, uh, I doubt that there will be a uh, full withdrawal. Uh, but from uh, Zaporozhye and um, uh, Kherson provinces, all of that is up in the air. And the Russians have been sending uh, very confusing and uh, potentially intentionally mixed messaging, because on the one hand, they're uh, um, implementing uh, uh, the ruble as a currency in those areas. They're switching everyone in Kherson, uh, which is just north of the Crimea, very active to Russian SIM cards. I've, I've seen numerous reports about that, uh, both in Ukrainian and in uh, Russian sources. So this sounds like they're not really going anywhere. But on the other hand, does this is this a preparation for the recognition of independent uh, sort of uh, states that will be completely dependent on Russia? Uh, potentially so. Uh, is this a precursor to full annexation? That's also a possibility. And that may be one of the bargaining chips that the Russians will bring to the table. Professor Richard Arnold, great to have you with us on the show. Welcome to the show. Um, the New York Times published a list of what it says are the people who are key to resolving this conflict diplomatically. Number one on that list is Vladimir Putin, number two is Vladimir Putin, and number three is Vladimir Putin. Um, do you agree that only President Putin can bring an end to this conflict, or is it a negotiation that has to take place between President Putin, President Zelensky, and President Biden in the United States? Um, well, <clears throat> so given the nature of the Russian political system, I think this is Putin's war. This was Putin's war to start. It'll be Putin's war to end. I think it's really up to, he's the only one who can really make that call um, about when to go to the negotiating table. What about a role for the United States? Um, the presence of the United States, um, I think, can be overstated uh, somewhat, at least directly, the direct um, influence of the United States um, and ability to influence on Zelensky. 
might be there, but I don't think a direct role in the negotiations would be particularly helpful. We would give substance to some of Putin's claims that this is really a war of Russia against the West. Right. The reason I ask uh, Professor Arnold whether there is a role for the United States is it's because the United States is now supplying the bulk of weapons to mm -hmm. Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, absolutely. But um, I still don't think there's a room there for a direct role for the United States in peace negotiations. We've been very clear throughout the conflict that this is up to the Ukrainians to decide, and we're helping them out rather than um, rather than playing a role in the war. Max Blumenthal, great to see you again, Max. Uh, let's look at, at another aspect of this conflict after 100 days. The West has imposed harsh and very sweeping sanctions on Russia. But if we look at what's happened after 100 days, the ruble has gained in value. Uh, the country's balance of payments, it's healthy. In fact, it's the healthiest it's ever been. Russia continues to sell its energy on international markets, and most of Europe is now playing in rubles as well. In fact, we have President Biden, who now seems to be scrambling to hold his anti-Russian coalition together. So in a sense, have these sanctions failed? Have they backfired? Well, it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you ask many of the people that fund the campaigns of American politicians, they're doing pretty well. Um, down in Texas, the guys in the LNG industry, liquid natural gas, are pretty happy about the cancellation of Nord Stream 2 and the boycott of Russian oil. Uh, they're celebrating. And so are Texan politicians. Uh, if you ask the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, where our defense secretary Lloyd Austin used to serve as a board member, they're pretty happy as well because that $40 billion so-called aid package to Ukraine is going right back into their pockets and to those of their employees and mid-level staffers who are gentrifying neighborhoods right around me in Washington. So a lot of people are pretty happy. Working class Americans are not doing pretty, not doing very well. And Biden has attempted to uh, deflect blame by calling it the Putin price hike, when in fact, these sanctions represent an economic war of choice waged by the Biden administration and the hawks that surround him and essentially control his policies. And it has doomed Europe to a very dark winter. And that may be a ricochet effect that Washington might be satisfied with. It doesn't want to see a strong Germany. It doesn't want to see a strong independent France. Uh, Finland is in, appears to be in deep trouble. I believe they import 80 percent of their oil from Russia. I mean, this is a decision made out of arrogance by a Washington that is accustomed to kicking around weak post-colonial nations like Syria, Iraq, and Libya. Now they're going up against the largest exporter of oil in the world. Uh, it, exports more net oil, in, I think, than Saudi Arabia does. And so it also exposes moral hypocrisy. Biden has refused to allow Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua to attend the Summit of Americas, which is taking place right now, I believe, in Los Angeles. And at the same, and, and he's done so because they are supposedly not democratic. And yet he is going to Saudi Arabia, begging on his knees to Mohammed bin Salman, one of the most autocratic rulers in the world, to open up the taps and make up for the lost oil. So this has backfired badly on Washington and Europe will ultimately pay the biggest price. And we're also going to see ricochet effects in the global south with literal famines. One other quick point, uh, Max, very briefly. Uh, you know, we've been talking about who is key to bringing this to an end. And we, you've, we've heard from two of our other guests that it's Vladimir Putin. Uh, what is your view on that? Well, the New York Times said Putin is one, two, and three on its list. And I would list the New York Times as the top three, one, two, and three in the biggest misinformers in the U.S. media. I mean, they've been predicting a st stunning Ukrainian military victory, and now the tide has turned and they're begrudgingly acknowledging that this war is going to end in a negotiated settlement. We know from Ukrainian Pravda that Boris Johnson actually traveled to Kiev specifically to tell Zelensky not to negotiate, and I believe there are psychological factors at play as well. You have a celebrity puppet in the role of his life in charge of the post-Maidan regime right now, and as soon as he negotiates an end and gives up land to Russia, which Joe Biden himself today has acknowledged will ultimately have to happen, as soon as Zelensky does that, uh, there, and if he had done that weeks ago, those appearances at Cannes, at Davos, at the Grammys are going to start to dry up, and he puts his golden parachute in peril as well. The West and Zelensky's actual constituency among the NATO elite 
They don't want to see a negotiated settlement right now. They want to see this war going on. And you know what's happening? Zelensky himself has acknowledged that 60 to 100 Ukrainian soldiers are being lost every day. He said that in an interview with Newsmax, 500 wounded every day. This is the butcher block that's necessary to sustain his celebrity on the world stage and to continue lining All the right. pockets Let Lockheed get... and Raytheon CEOs. All right. Let me get Pablo's response to that. Pablo, I mean, we just heard President Zelensky being described there as a celebrity puppet. Well, I can't really respond to that. I mean, he is the president of Ukraine, elected by the majority of the people, and he represents the people of Ukraine. I would ask uh, for the Mr. Mack not to insult the people who have actually shown quite more bravery than throwing insults in TV. And in fact, when you say that the New York Times or someone else has been predicting a standing Ukrainian victory, I would remind you that everyone was predicting Ukrainian defeat and Ukraine crumbling in three days and the Russian offensive, which has not happened at all. So Ukrainians, I believe, have shown themselves fully to be quite capable of defending themselves. And thank you, we will be able to do that without uh, some strange advice that you are giving us. Uh, nevertheless, I would like advice to restate. Advice to negotiate. Advice to negotiate. I would negotiate. like to restate that Ukraine is not only willing to negotiate, but it clearly both the leadership of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine understand the need to end the war as quickly as possible. But, and I repeat, the keys to that lie fully at the doors of the aggressor, Russia. Russia has started this war. Putin started this war. They are the ones continuing this war. The war is going exclusively in Ukrainian territory. And that is the reason why this is continuing. And that is the reason why the world is having economic problems with energy, but also with foodstuffs, which cannot be exported from Ukraine, one of the largest food exporters in the world. This is all happening because of Russia. This is happening because the uh, major oil producer, as you've called them, has essentially gone crazy. And in a global economy where everyone is interconnected, they've started acting like someone crazy. This is what is happening. Okay, Pablo, and this let me, crazy let me ask you this. regime the... has to be put down to some right. level. What? where they actually return to some semblance of normal relationships okay. with the world. Okay, Pablo, what this kind of advice... This is not about Ukraine. What kind of advice has President Zelensky been getting from people like Boris Johnson and Joe Biden? As far as I know, President Zelensky is getting uh, aid, both economic and military, from the nations of the West to help Ukraine fight Russia, which is a stronger power both economically, numerically, and militarily. And this has worked. This help is very appreciated. Yeah. This indeed has helped Ukraine protect itself, though the ones who were actually doing this were Ukrainian soldiers, and we are the ones dying on the front lines, not anyone else. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this does not mean that Ukrainians wish to die because Putin wants to attack Ukraine. We want peace. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's, uh, Russia has to actually do that, you know, want peace as well, for it to happen. It's impossible to get peace when only Ukraine is the one who wants it, and Russia simply continues to attack. Anton Fedyashin, something else has changed, and we see this after 100 days of this conflict. In fact, this change probably has started a long time before that. But we see President Biden now packing his bags, going off to Saudi Arabia to plead with the Saudi leaders there to increase their oil output. Uh, an effort to get India to join in the condemnation of Russia um, failed. Um, and we see the similar kind of situation coming from countries in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East as well. I mean, are we seeing a changed world order here? Well, we're seeing the speeding up of a process that uh, began at least a decade ago. And uh, as I've said on your show before, and let me reiterate this, um, uh, wars very often uh, act as catalysts. And this war is not only not an exception, it's, it'll be studied, uh, I think, for m many decades ahead as one of the most important turning points in global history, because this war is suddenly speeding up. Uh, things that had uh, begun before, and uh, the the general trend here is um, the gradual uh, de-Americanization of the geoeconomic uh, order for good and for uh, for worse. 
um, anyone who thinks that, you know, a, a, a Russian defeat by some miracle in this war is going to snap everything uh, back to the year 2000 or 2001, I think is, uh, is missing at least two decades of, uh, of history. Um, th this war really has become sort of a litmus test. Mm. Um, and if you don't focus on votes in the UN, which, important as they are symbolically, um, carry no binding uh, legal authority, if you look at the countries that have not joined the very real decisions to sanction, cut ties, uh, or otherwise punish uh, Russia, you see a very interesting trend, which is that the the Atlantic world, with a few very powerful allies in uh, the Pacific, um, are in one block, which contains about a quarter of the planet's population, but the other 75 percent, give or take, live in the part of the world that has not taken a position here and that is willing to negotiate with the Russians. I'll just remind everyone that the head of the um, African Union was in Sochi, in Russia, in southern Russia today, meeting with Putin. Um, and uh, one of the statements that he made is that, uh, from the African perspective, uh, it's not so much the war as the Western sanctions on Russia that are considered to be the big threat to food security. And of course, Africa and the Middle East and the poorer nations in South Asia will be the ones to suffer the most uh, in the coming months. Max, listening to what Anton was saying there, is it fair to say that the United States can no longer assume that it's now the, or will be, the unchallenged top dog? No, and this is different than the first Cold War. The U.S. wants to enter into a new Cold War. It will be in a much weaker position than during the first Cold War, and it will be going up against a Russian and Chinese bloc in many ways, a political bloc. And China has benefited enormously, actually, from Western and specifically U.S. sanctions on Russian oil. China has been buying oil from Russia at a discounted rate, fueling its economy, uh, while Western Europe is going to starve. I mean, they're banning 90 percent of Russian oil it, it, starting in the winter, as well as gas. Germany gets something like 65 percent of its gas right. from Russia. And the one country that's refusing to go along with the EU, Hungary, is now the target it's being ganged up on by other EU members who are trying to get rid of the EU consensus vote, just simply because Hungary doesn't want to commit national suicide. Mm -hmm. And what, what is yeah. Europe doing? They're committing, uh, they're essentially committing economic suicide, yeah. plunging their workers and poor into misery in order to satisfy the almost libidinal desire yeah. for conflict with Russia emanating from Washington. Right. So there's no way Washington comes out of this on top. It's okay. part of a, it's accelerating a longstanding process. Professor Arnold, what's your view on that when we look at these deep divisions between what is called the West, which is basically Europe and North America, which is sometimes Washington refers to as the international community and the rest of the world? Um, well, it's certainly true that the rest of the world is, you know, unfortunately, famine is going to is going to affect the rest of the world more severely than um, than North America and Europe, I think. Um, but I, I think there's been a lot of focus in this discussion on the consequences for the West and the consequences for the West and the global South. Uh, one time, Ukraine was actually called the furthest north of the global south. But nobody's really talking about the consequences of this in Russia. And Russia was already a, a country that was, was pretty much falling apart. It had a, a, a parlous demographic situation, an absolutely terribly low um, rate of life expectancy, and an economy which was based entirely on oil, and oil which is being phased out, uh, albeit slowly, due to the threat posed by climate change. So I think the real danger here is actually for Russia. And I actually, I do think that there's a, if there's a, a realistic chance that we might see, you know, they're having very negative consequences within Russia itself. Max Blumenthal, there's another aspect of this conflict which we don't see reported very widely in the Western media, and that is the role of Nazi forces in Ukraine. Um, before this conflict started, President Putin talked about denazifying Ukraine, and that statement was ridiculed in the Western media. But you've done quite a bit of work on this. What have you found? Well, we just reported at the Gray Zone that the Department of Homeland Security 
is has issued a private document that's been leaked, obviously, into the press, that it's stating its concern about some of the 20,000 foreigners uh, and Americans coming back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. with advanced tactical training and experience, new experience. Many of them are already Army veterans, yeah. and contacts with an international network of fascists and war criminals. One particular figure, a notorious white nationalist from Texas named Paul Gray, has appeared on Fox News six times. In most of those appearances, Fox did not even name him. He has committed violent crimes in the U.S. and is fighting on the Ukrainian battlefield alongside the Ukrainian Legion. Then there's Craig Lang, a murderer, someone who killed a couple in Texas, stole their money in order to go abroad, who has also been indicted by the Justice Department for participating in torture with a Ukrainian neo-Nazi battalion right sector. In, at one point, he helped torture, drown a woman to death and administer adrenaline so she would stay alive during her drowning. This is a sick individual, along with many okay. other sick fighting on the Ukrainian battlefield. Right. How did he get there? Max, How did these a, figures get there? But I've just got a little bit of time left. I want to get Pablo's response to that. Pablo, these uh, allegations have been made over and over. What's your response to it? Pablo, why, why does mm. your military mm. welcome so many Nazis from my country? Why are they okay, drawn to let's, let's give Pablo a chance to respond to that. Mm, I, I can't verify this information. In fact, it sounds like a bunch of lies to me. I'm sorry. It would have to be verified by someone credible and independent, not someone well, obvious. Ukraine just fired its public information so, officer for selling lies about Russian uh, rape. Uh, now, return, returning to the general myth of neo-Nazis somewhere in Ukraine, I would remind you that Ukraine has one of the lowest levels of support of any kind of far-right political parties throughout all democratic nations, right? The only real military unit that supposedly had some far-right connections was the Azov, which was clearly vetted in 2017, turned into a military regiment without any kind of political connections. Okay. And you literally cannot find any. You probably find more neo-Nazi or far-right connection in any kind of military in the world than in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same so, time, Ukraine is being attacked by a country whose president why did started Azov the war by justifying it. I'm sorry, let me finish, local? please. Let me finish, Okay, very please. quickly. We've got a few seconds okay. left. Thank you. Mr. Putin started the war with the claims that Ukrainian nation does not exist and essentially is waging it as a genocide, as okay. a means to destroy a nation. Okay. Who is a Nazi here? Russians are Nazis here, not Ukrainians. We are going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.